Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Yoros Makris. Uh, Yoros Makris is an associate professor at Yale University in the Departments of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science there. He's the founder and director of the Testable and Reliable Architectures Lab at uh, Yale University. So the acronym, as you can see, is TRELLA. So me and Yoros are both Greeks, and uh, TRELLA in Greek actually means madness. So that's definitely an interesting uh, choice for the name of the group. So today, you're also going to be talking about hardware trojans in wireless cryptographic integrated circuits. Excellent. So um, the work that I will describe is a new research project that uh, a student of mine, Yerjin, and myself have started about a couple of years ago. Um, I have a first set of results that I will be sharing with you. It's a new exciting area for us as we're, mift as we're sifting more from test and reliability towards hardware security. I'll tell you a little bit about my background and the research that we've been doing in my lab um, and how we kind of saw a natural transition by applying some of our ideas in the security area and more specifically in uh, wireless cryptographic ICs and the problem of hardware trojans. Okay, so um, a little bit about the research that we're doing. I come with a background that is a mix of computer science and electrical engineering. I started more as a computer scientist and gradually shifted more towards electrical engineering, and then I'm kind of oscillating between the two. Um, most of my work has been in the analog RF domain. Um, uh, the problems that we're looking at have to do with defects that occur in the manufacturing process and uh, defects that, or degradation of products that happen while a product is deployed in the field over its lifetime. And we're mostly interested in providing solutions for low cost testing of analog and RF components and uh, additional circuitry that will monitor the operation of an analog RF component and uh, signify signal whenever there is some malfunction happening. So um, my computer science wannabe kind of uh, uh, attitude came in as we started looking into these problems. So we're trying to mix a little bit ideas from machine learning and statistical analysis and use them to simplify the problems that we're dealing with. Um, so we are using machine learning to reduce the cost of manufacturing testing. Every chip that comes out of the foundry has to be tested to make sure that it complies to the specifications before it's being shipped to the customers. And that is a rather expensive process. Uh, to give you a data point, about 35 to 40 percent of the price that you pay for an analog RF component has been spent just for the purpose of testing it, uh, which is a quite significant amount since testing really doesn't add any functionality to the device. So uh, as the frequency goes up, devices, the, the expensive equipment to test the, these devices become more and more expensive. So uh, the industry is looking for alternatives and we've developed a machine learning based paradigm to reduce the cost of testing. Some of these ideas were ported over to what I will be talking about today, which is the problem of hardware trojans in wireless you know, analog RF cryptographic circuits. Uh, we are also using similar ideas to enhance yield of products by designing knobs. Uh, designers today are very uh, pessimistic, so they leave a lot of margin for the process variations. Uh, instead, what we've been doing is that we add some tuning knobs to the design. So every chip that comes out, we fine-tune it carefully, uh, save the programming of the chip on the chip, and then uh, sell it that is transparent to the customer. So essentially, we're using our ideas from machine learning to find a cost-effective mechanism to fine-tune uh, an analog RF component by biasing voltages and uh, trimming re uh, resistances and things like that. We have designed on-chip checkers and online test methods which monitor the operation of an analog RF chip and tell you when something goes wrong. Uh, it's much more difficult to do that in the analog domain rather than in the digital domain. In the digital domain, you can have a duplicate, you can compare things. Uh, it's a very straightforward comparison. Straightforward comparison. In the analog domain, there is no two identical signals ever in order to compare them. So even designing a checker is very difficult. 
So most of my activities have been in the test and reliability domain of analog and RF circuits. We've been playing around with modern microprocessors and doing some analysis of their immunity to soft errors, um, designing error detection, error correction methods for finite state machines using parity and various other codes. Um, we have a big activity that is coming to an end now on asynchronous circuits, circuits that do not have a clock and they operate with local handshakes between them. These circuits have been gaining a little bit of more traction recently for the purpose of low power. Uh, presumably, you're saving all the power that your clock is uh, burning as it ticks continuously. And you're also avoiding the problems with the uh, electromagnetic interference that clocks generate as you increase the frequency. So we have developed methods for uh, testing and monitoring correctness of operation for asynchronous circuits. And the last new activity that we have in the group has to do with the configurable computing. Specifically, we have developed a new paradigm for what we call hardware-software co-execution, where the actual hardware on which the software is being executed, every clock cycle transforms itself. So you're kind of seamlessly integrating what the hardware is doing and what the software is doing. You're evolving the circuit as you go along. Uh, you can do that with today's dynamically reconfigurable FPGAs, but it is not very efficient. It's very power consuming. There's a lot of new technologies that have come about in the last three to five years of how to build um, non-volatile memories that can be used more effectively for this purpose. We are specifically working with magnetic tunneling junctions, which we configure as non-volatile memory cells, essentially, and with ferroelectric uh, FETs or MOTFETs, which can also be used uh, in order to store this information. So these are the list of activities, range of activities we've been playing with. And today, I'll just focus on the hardware Trojan detection problem, one of our new exciting uh, areas as we try to get more into hardware security. The general paradigm, I'm going to do this on this slide so that you kind of know what to expect as I go through the rest of the presentation. Um, what has been driving our research is an observation that throughout the lifetime of a product, there is a humongous amount of data that is being generated. You start with the designers who generate a lot of data through simulation. Uh, you move on to first silicon. You get a lot of data from process characterization, from uh, PCM, process control monitors, information that you get from the wafers or from the dyes themselves. Eventually, you move on to high volume manufacturing. You have yield characterization data that tell you a lot about, about the fabrication process. You have the actual tests, the performance tests of the circuit. Eventually, you have some customer returns from the field, chips that don't work. You collect all this data. You have diagnostic information. There's a, a rich amount of information here that is not being utilized in today's semiconductor industry at all. They collect the data, locally use it to do the exact reason for which the data was collected, but there's nothing really tying everything together to acquire knowledge about the design, about the process. There's very little being done. So our approach to all of these problems is that there is a rich set of correlations between all of this data, which we should tap into and try to exploit this through what I call intelligent systems, and then use these correlations to simplify tasks such as reducing the cost of testing these products, um, improving the yield, and learning more about whether we can trust these devices or not. So this is what we will talk about today, and this is kind of an introduction of how we came from most of my work, which has been in this area, and moved a little bit into the hardware trojan. By the way, you can feel free to st stop me and ask questions if you uh, have any. Um, so let's start with the need for trusted hardware. Of course, the reason why this is becoming more and more important today has to do with the globalization of the IC design and manufacturing process. Having a completely controlled and trusted <coughs> supply chain for the chips that are used in sensitive infrastructure uh, is infeasible today. The US government does have an agreement with IBM, it's called Trusted Foundry Agreement, and there is a particular facility where everything is very closely monitored and uh, trusted. But the volume of devices that you can get through that Trusted Foundry and the cost is very, very high. So um, on the other hand, the risk of having 
something that is undesired, unwanted, and possibly malignant in the hardware that we're using in sensitive applications can be very high, given the extent of where these chips go today. So uh, as we're more and more outsourcing and uh, uh, changing the way, the paradigm of how we acquire all these chips that are used in our systems, the concern about their trustworthiness has become uh, very high, especially for the government. And there's a lot of efforts trying to address this problem. Um, on the other, at the same time, technology maturing has also given an opportunity for such things to be uh, staged, such attacks to be staged. So there is more free space. Area is cheap. On silicon area is cheap. There's a lot of free area on your, on your die. You can hide things there. No one will ever know. The complexity of a design is increasing. So it's much more and more, uh, it's more and more difficult to just look at the design and find out that there's something in there that shouldn't be there. So uh, the advanced technology offers more opportunity for perpetrators to stage attacks with hardware trojans. And of course, compromising circuits, given the complexity of the big system on chip designs that we have today, can be done at various stages. They can be done at the hardware description language stage, where you acquire intellectual property from third party. You go and buy this core and you put it into your design. It meets your specs, but how do you know that it doesn't do anything else that it is not supposed to be doing? And it can be done all the way down to the polygon level. People can actually alter the masks with which you fabricate the wafers and then the chips. So there's a whole spectrum of things that can happen. A little bit more, uh, it's an interesting set of slides that I found by, in a paper by Jokerst and others. This is a plot of the production phase and where the profit, where the profit is made. So as you can see, the profit is mainly made from at the concept level, at the surfaces level, industrial design and final sale. This, which is the nitty gritty details, are not providing much of the profit. So it's not surprising that these are the ones that are mostly outsourced. Okay? So the high level ideas, services, etc., cetera, uh, that provide the profit are kept in-house under caps. And the ones that are more generic are being outsourced. At the same time, this is a, the circuit risk curve. If you look at where these attacks can happen, you will see that they're not going to happen at the concept level or at the services level. They're most likely going to happen in those other nitty gritty detail stages. So your risk throughout the production phase, again, tends to happen where the high level of outsourcing occurs. And that's what creates the problem. There's an opportunity and there's a reason there. Here's another view. Yes? Out of curiosity, is this imaginary threats or this is there are actual cases that happen? Okay. Excellent question. Um, there are, of course, no one is going to come out and acknowledge that they did this. Okay? But there are undocumented claimed cases. Uh, I'll give you two examples. One has to do with uh, a failure of a Syrian, uh, of, of the raiders of the Syrian Air Force. Uh, uh, when they were attacked by Israeli uh, aircraft about three years ago. And the other has to do with a very well-known semiconductor manufacturing company in France. Um, there are not that many. I'm not going to say the name, but you can imagine who this is. Uh, who has acknowledged that in the chips that they deploy for, uh, in French military equipment, namely planes, ships, etc., they have what they call the kill switch, which is a remote way of accessing and shutting down the chips, destroying essentially the chip, burning them, so that in case it falls in their own hands, uh, they won't have the ability to count reverse engineer or identify what this particular chip is doing. Um, I will also answer it in a different way. The problem is important enough for the Department of Def Defense to be spending about $30 million right now on developing counterattacks, countermeasures for these attacks. There's a program called TRUST, which is run by DARPA. There's various smaller efforts run by the 
Air Force Office of Scientific Research, ONR, and the likes. So this is something that has been picking up uh, speed and interest. Uh, there is money involved. I can't say that how real the risk is. I believe it is technically feasible very easily to stage attacks like that. I'm sure that it is, uh, there is a motive for all of that because the stakes are high, uh, judging from where these chips end up. Um, but again, no one's going to come out publicly and acknowledge, yes, this is what we're doing. So, yes. What's the name of that program again? Trust. Is it unclassified? Yeah. Um, there's a part of it that is classified, and that has to do with the countermeasures that the performers have developed. Uh, Lincoln Labs is the, uh, one of the teams involved, and uh, JHU APL, the Applied Physics Lab, is the evaluator. So they've, what DARPA did is that they developed a chip which has uh, Trojans in it, and they have various teams developing methods that will identify and uncover these um, Trojans, and then they score them based, they grade them based on uh, how many of the Trojans they were able to uncover. I believe they have classified the design of the Trojans, and they, I'm not sure if they have classified the countermeasures. I mean, this is a typical problem when we're talking about sensitive things like Trojans. I'm sure the same thing has happened in the, um, in the software world, even with viruses. There are two schools of thought. One is, well, let's put it out there, and the good guys will outperform the bad guys. Uh, the other is, keep it under caps as much as you can. So. Um, whenever the government gets involved, it's probably keep it under caps as much as you can. But I don't have funding from them, so I can talk about it. <laughs> um, this is the typical supply chain. This is what would happen 30 years ago. Uh, everything is trusted. So 30 years ago, if you were developing uh, chips to go into the airplanes, the fighter planes, etc., you'd have your own development of intellectual property, your own in-house tools, your own library of standard cells and models of how things work. You would come up with specifications, design, talk to the fab directly, everything is trusted, build the masks, build the chips, test them, package them, deploy them, and monitor their operation. So everything used to be trusted because most of it was in-house, within the country, well controlled. Um, things have changed dramatically. So very few things are now really trusted. You can trust the specifications because you're writing them. But other than that, everything in between can be either trusted or untrusted, depending on how you're running your business and who your providers and suppliers are. Eventually, you get chips back. You get a piece of silicon that does what it is supposed to do. That you can test. But how do you know that it does only that? And it doesn't have other capabilities hidden in there that you're unaware of, uh, which potentially a perpetrator can exploit and uh, cause damage. Especially these stages, um, which are now almost exclusively in the Far East, are the least trustworthy, uh, just because this is how it is. These are the same chips that go uh, in the highly sensitive applications as before, only we don't know whether we can trust the fab that made the chip or made the masks, etc. Again, it is very easy, technically, to stage an attack if you have the resources. So let's talk about the basics of hardware Trojans a little bit and then move on to the work that we have done. So what's a hardware Trojan? It's a malicious modification to an integrated circuit which allows a perpetrator to interfere with its operation, steal information, snoop data, uh, or even destroy the chip. Now, if this is a chip that is controlling you know, a flight of a military fighter jet, that could be devastating. Uh, trigger is the actual activation mechanism. A hardware Trojan might be always on and will not rely on a particular event in order to become activated. Or it could be activated when a sequence of events happens, one particular event happens. As you can imagine, depending on the trigger, the, the value and the utility of the hardware Trojan is different because um, the perpetrator might have to have access to the input space of the chip in order to, or physically or remotely, in order to activate the Trojan. By payload, we usually refer to the effect of the hardware Trojan, which could be alter the functionality, you know, mess up the results of a computation, 
denial of service can happen, uh, and even destroying the chip is not that difficult to do if you get access to the internals. Um, implanting states can be done anywhere in the fabrication chain that I showed you earlier. Most of the current research, including what DARPA is funding, ha assumes that the culprit is in the foundry, either in the building of the masks or in the actual fabrication process of the silicon. They're also very interested in the third-party hardware IP, and there's a new program that they're trying to fund right now in, uh, within DARPA. Um, I don't think it has been, a BAA has been released yet, but uh, it's in the works from what I hear. And that has to do exclusively with hardware IP because there's a, a very large percentage of the chips that are being built by system integrators involves third-party hardware IP. You're not going to design your own digital signal processor every time or your own microprocessor. You will just go and acquire hardware IP in the form of a hardware description language and merge it with your own design. So there's a lot of interest there. I'll, uh, I'll remember and I'll tell you. It is, uh, it's from MTO, it's Microsystems Technology Office. Trying to remember the program manager's name, but it evades me right now. I won't remember it. Uh, Dean Collins. Dean Collins is the program manager. Um, the one obvious question is, okay, these chips come out of the foundry and they might have this malicious circuitry, added circuitry in there. Don't we test these chips before we sell them? Can't we find these hardware trojans? Well, we do test them, but testing is expensive, and uh, we only test for a few things. We cannot test exhaustively the entire functionality of a chip. That's infeasible. We only have anywhere between five and 10 seconds that the chip sits on a tester before we can say, okay, sell it or throw it away. So we just exercise a small input subspace of the patterns, which basically makes sure that a particular model of defects, which we call faults, doesn't exist in the chip. So we can't even guarantee that it perfectly fits its own, the functionality it's supposed to be doing. We can say that it doesn't have the defects in our model, and that's about it. You could reverse engineer the chip. You could scrape it open layer by layer and make sure, you know, reverse engineer the, the, the masks that it was built from. But then first you have destroyed the chip, so you can only do sampling. And second, it's very time consuming and expensive. So none of these solutions would be able to tell you whether the chip has extra functionality over and above what it is supposed to be doing. Two lines of research that have been proposed towards uh, identifying hardware trojans. The first is called enhanced functional testing. So if this is the small subspace of patterns that we apply to the chip in order to find defects, some ideas, some researchers have proposed ideas to add some more uh, patterns which are specifically geared towards what the uh, attacker would be doing. So those are uh, Trojan geared uh, patterns and I'll tell you a little bit more about what they are. But still, I mean, you're looking for a needle in a haystack and uh, it's impossible because y you can't win the numbers game, okay? The this input space is infinite in a sequential chip. So there's no way you will be able to win in this numbers game. Uh, the, the idea that people have been pushing is that, well, what is the attacker going to do? Let's get into the attacker's shoes and think about it. Uh, they will probably try to create a trigger which is not happening very frequently. Otherwise, during testing, you might accidentally run into it. So those rarely occurring events are supposedly what the attacker will use as a trigger. And then the idea is, okay, let's analyze our design, find what events are run rare, and then uh, either redesign our circuit so that we can make these rare events not rare in test mode, or create more patterns so that we particularly uh, make this rare event happen during our test procedure. But again, this is a a needle in a haystack. I don't think that any of this uh, line, anything in this line of work has a chance because you're really playing a chess game here and you, you can't win in a, in a numbers game like that. But the idea is, okay, the attacker will use something that is 
rare to trigger, so in test mode we're not going to see it. So let's try to enhance our test mode by events that are rare, which we wouldn't usually use in our test routines. Um, so that's one of the lines of work. The other one, which is much more promising in my opinion, is the use of side channel information and uh, generically called side channel fingerprint. So here, the idea is that if we can get a set of golden chips, which we usually can because there is a trusted foundry. Um, for, for low volume, you could get a golden uh, circuit, a trusted circuit. Then we can create a, a reference fingerprint, and that could be using power information, currents, delays, all sorts of parametric information based on which we can build a fingerprint of the trusted chips. And the idea is that if a perpetrator adds something else, those fingerprints will be violated to a certain extent. So you could see the distribution of chips that are Trojan infested would be, would exhibit different statistical characteristics than the distribution of chips that have Trojans in them. So the existence of Trojan would uh, skew the distribution of these signatures. And ideas that have been proposed along this line are using global power trace, uh, using local currents, and uh, using path delays. All of this works well for small circuits. If you have a circuit that you know, has a couple of million of gates, and that's a small circuit today, uh, and you add five gates as a hardware trojan, the impact on power or on current is going to be so minimal that it's noise. It's below the noise level. You cannot detect it. And uh, all of the authors of these works, including our own with path delay information, acknowledge that this is not something that will scale unless you do some clever you know, divide and conquer kind of approach to uh, bring out the impact of the Trojans. Yes? So in this model, if the um, <coughs> designer has chosen some well-known components, let's say you need a digital analog converter, you just bought one, put on the chip, so it's a well-known mm -hmm. design. And that's actually where the compromise is. This wouldn't actually detect that because it would still behave as the designer intended. In other words, it's, he's still in the chain of custody at that point when he's taking someone else's IP in. Correct. So if he fail in this case. these methods all assume that um, the, the attack will be staged past the point where we have um, um, authorized the design to be fabricated. So we've, we've designed the circuit, we acquired all the IP, we put the chip together, we have a GDS2 file which is the format to go to, to talk to the fabrication foundry, and at the interface between that point and what you get back as silicon, things happen. That, you can, that is the model of attack that these methods are after. So. Uh, if the IP that you used is already compromised, this is not going to work. Yeah. Unless the golden reference chip was not compromised. But then we're moving up to the hardware IP issue, which is we're getting into software trust now, which is a completely different domain. So Another point I want to make is that all of these uh, methods have only been, and all the work that has been done on Trojan circuits, including what DARPA is funding, has to do with digital circuits. And a little bit of FPGAs, there's interest there because there's a lot of FPGA uh, that goes into uh, military designs. But no one has touched analog circuits, and I believe that we were the first ones that started talking about hardware Trojans in wireless uh, chips. So why are we interested in wireless cryptographic chips? Well, first of all, we have the background. We've been doing test and reliability for analog RF chips, but the key uh, motivating point is that this is a type of chip that if I'm an attacker I'd probably go after something like this because I can access it remotely. These chips talk to the environment over public channels. Yes, they are encrypted, the information exchange is encrypted, but it is much more reasonable for me to assume that I will uh, eavesdrop on a communication of a chip like that than access physically a chip in order to stage an in, give an input to a chip and stage my attack. So there's a lot of applications of wireless cryptographic ICs, you know, our sensor networks, contactless smart cards, 
all of the things that we do today is moving to wireless. So uh, the key architecture of a wireless cryptographic chip, you have some kind of a processing unit that generates a message. The message gets encrypted with a key, which is usually stored on the chip. Uh, then there is an analog component here. There's an interface, D2A interface. The encrypted text is then wirelessly transmitted over a public channel. So since you're transmitting over a public channel, it is easy for me to assume that I can eavesdrop the communication and try to steal information from there. We have a project going on called Thwart, um, Trojan Hardware and Wireless ICs. We, it has basically five components. Uh, we set out to first analyze and understand what kind of hardware Trojans we could design and put them into these wireless ICs. Let's understand how difficult it is to compromise those chips so that we can then develop appropriate countermeasures. The second component is identify the limitations of existing test methods. So if we find out what the universe or sub-universe of hardware Trojans is, then we will develop, we will try to see existing test methods and characterize them and figure out how well they work or they don't work. Uh, then we want to, do, to, have, to develop preventive methods. How can I design my, my, my chip so that if someone tries to compromise, um, they will mess things up. I can make it very sensitive to alterations. That's a bad idea because the fabrication process has variation. It's not tightly controlled, so my yield will go low. Many of my chips, if they're very sensitive to any kind of alteration, um, then when I build them, most of them won't work. But there are other ideas of how to make your design sensitive. You're, you're, tra you're creating traps, essentially, that you anticipate the attacker to fall in uh, before they are able to stage the attack. And of course, the detection methods, once you get the chips back, how can we come up with efficient methodologies to check whether hardware trojans exist in there or not. And uh, finally, integrate all this together uh, in a chip and fabricate our own chips, some of which will be compromised, some of them won't be compromised, in order to demonstrate the methodologies in silicon. So this is a, an NSF-funded project that we have going on uh, in my lab right now. Okay, so what is the objective of hardware trojans in a wireless cryptographic IC? What do you want to know when you're eavesdropping the information that is communicated between a chip like that and the environment? Well, I would want to know the key. I think that's a very uh, tangible objective. I want to steal information. I want to know what the key is so that I can then take the ciphertext and extract the plain text out of it. Uh, we assume that any kind of Trojan which will try to leverage the publicly transmitted information in order to steal the key or steal the plain text uh, will have to hide the leaked data as some kind of structure, structure in the statistical sense, on the parameters of the wireless transmission signal. So you're sending a wireless transmission signal, which is an analog signal, which the attacker has access to. It's publicly in some in a public frequency. You can just listen to it, and somehow you have to have this extra structure on the signal that you, as a perpetrator, know in advance what the structure is, from which you can extract the uh, stolen information. The parameters can be frequency, it can be uh, amplitude, things like that. Some assumptions, um, since we're talking about a chip that you don't need to physically access, we assume that the wireless trojan is going to be always on. So continuously, it will be leaking the information that you want to snoop. Um, we are assuming that there is no need to modify the logic of the circuit itself, because otherwise the traditional test methods would detect it. We also assume that this hardware Trojan will not violate the analog specifications, because then analog testing would detect that there's something wrong with the chip. Um, ascent, and of course, the system operates uh, as it should. In other words, let me try to summarize this in a way. Um, what an attacker will try to exploit is the fact that because of the fabrication process variations, no two chips are identical. Okay? So when you transmit a signal from two different chips, the signal is not going to be identical. There's going to be a margin. So when you define specifications for these chips, those specifications are not absolute numbers. They're windows. 
So there's a margin of error there, a margin so that your chips, despite the process variations, will continue to operate within specs. So that margin is exactly what a perpetrator will try to uh, exploit. They will try to hide the additional behavior of the chip within that margin. So from an outsider's point of view who doesn't know that there is something extra hidden in that signal, the signal will look perfectly legitimate, meeting all the specifications. The system will, will work correctly. The digital part will pass its functional test. The analog part will pass its specification test. But for the person who is informed and knows what to look for, there's something extra there that they can get. OK, so uh, I'll give you the three key findings that we came up with in a preliminary study that led to this project. And then I'll give you all the, the details that will help you understand more what I'm talking about. Um, the first key point, key finding is that staging such an attack and stealing the key from a, a wireless cryptographic IC is very simple. Very simple modifications to the digital part and to the D2A interface of that chip are enough to allow me to leak the information while still complying to the assumptions that I showed earlier, hiding it within the process variation margin. And I don't even have to touch the analog component, which is the most, most sensitive part. Analog design is still considered an art. Uh, there no, there's no automation there. On the digital side, you, know, you write very low code, you push a button, and you get a chip. And the analog side, you have to carefully fine tune anything. So if you have to modify the, uh, uh, your transmitter or your receiver, things get a little trickier. It's harder to stage an attack on that part. But we can do it without this. We can only, all we have to do is uh, play a little bit with the interface, and I'll show you how. The key message here is that it's fairly easy to stage an attack on these chips. The, the second key message is that because these chips do these uh, methods, these trojans do exactly what I said, that they hide their behavior within the process variation margin, they're very difficult to detect. None of the existing methods for uh, functional testing, analog testing, system level testing, and none of the recently developed hardware trojan methods that I talked about earlier will be able to uncover these kinds of, uh, of trojans. And we've shown this, and I'll show you the details. And finally, uh, well, these are both bleak messages, right? It's very easy to stage an attack and very hard, for, very difficult to, to detect them. But there is hope. And in our mind, hope lies in statistics. So we're leveraging the fact that for the attacker to be able to discern the stolen information from the normal signal, there is this statistically defined structure on the transmission. So that structure, which has to be there, exists. We don't know what it is as defenders, but it's there. And because it's there, it's possible that if you do a statistical analysis, even a simple statistical analysis of what you see on the population of chips, in these transmissions, you will be able to expose the hardware trojan. And that's exactly what I will show you. Yes? So is the assumption here that the attacker is trying to exfiltrate the actual key so that then they can Correct. provide the encryption themselves? So you're looking for some kind of abnormality that represents their exfiltration and stuff? Yes. So what I'll, the two hardware trojans that I'll show you transmit the key, they piggyback the key information on the actual transmission in a way that it is not visible unless you know what you're looking for. And once you have the key, then you can just uh, uh, listen to the channel and decrypt anything that goes through. Um, there could be variants. I could be sending, because at the end of the day, you're sending zeros and ones. You're sending bits out. I could have chosen to send out the actual uh, 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 plain text, not the cipher text instead. But don't forget that we should not violate the constraint that the system should appear to be working normally. So what I hide and how I hide it has to be carefully selected. Let me show you the example that we have developed, and we can continue this. So this is a very simple circuit that we designed. It has a, a pipelined DES for the encryption, um, an output buffer in order to streamline the transmission. 
the digital to analog interface, and then an ultra wideband transmitter, which transmits through an antenna. Um, a couple of amplifiers here, pulse generator and gating generator in order to create the actual signal to be transmitted. So you're taking the zeros and the ones from the output buffer and you're creating the appropriate signals to be transmitted under the UWB protocol. Um, it's this, we designed it ourselves. It's just a proof of concept, simple circuit that we just wanted to small enough so that we can simulate uh, extensively using SPICE and uh, be able to analyze all the parametrics accurately. So that's our platform. DES encryption, streamlining through the buffer, digital to analog interface, transmission through an ultra wideband uh, transmitter. I'm sorry? What's the clock source? Uh, clock here? Here's a clock. And so you just have an external source? For your clock? Yes, yes. Again, this is a proof of concept. We haven't fabricated it yet. Uh, we did all the analysis and simulation. We're now moving to the fabrication stage. We're actually going to fabricate a more advanced version of that. Okay, so this is a, an example of what is being transmitted. This is a sample block transmission under the UWB protocol. The spikes are the ones and the little valleys are the zeros. Now this is a magnification of one of these spikes, which means that a one was transmitted. Typically you have, um, the, the UWB protocol allows you to operate anywhere between four and six gigahertz. Uh, you're transmitting 64 bit blocks. The key of DES is 56 uh, bits. And a logic one is typically reflected as a sequence of five to seven peaks that have to be over 300 microwatts. And at least one, of, one such peak has to be above 900 uh, Microwatts. This is what a typical UWB transmission of a logic one looks like. And anybody who builds a UWB transmitter has the flexibility to play anywhere in this range to create that kind of a transmission that will be then compatible with the UWB receivers. So when you're sending your ciphertext, your encrypted text, uh, every one is going to be looking something like this. And of course, you will have long periods of zeros. This is a bunch of zeros being transmitted here. Another one, 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 etc. So this is a signal that we're trying to piggyback on in order to steal the information. Okay, how do we do it? Well, um, we developed two different Trojans. They have a tiny little modification on the software, on the digital part, and another tiny little modification on the D2A interface. The modification on the uh, digital part is the part that actually steals the key. So the key is stored somewhere on the chip. So what we want to do is use an enhanced version of the flip-flops that hold the key and connect them in a rotator mode. So what we do is that every time you, we send a block of information, we also leak on that block one bit of the key. So we need 56 block transmissions in order to, sit, to, to steal the DES key. Um, one bit at a time is how we do it. We could do more advanced encodings, but again, this is a proof of concept to show that this can be done. Um, so the little extra logic here serves the purpose of stealing the key and rotating it so that every time we advance our counter and we send another block out, we also send the next uh, key, the next bit of the key. The area and power impact of this extra logic is minimal. We're talking about 0.02% of what the chip was do doing. So this is uh, negligible for, for all intensive purposes. You cannot really detect anything based on such small percentages. So the key message here is every time you send a block, we have taken a key, a bit of the key, and we're transmitting it. So after 56 transmissions, you have the entire key. Maybe in a rotated version because you don't know where you started uh, eavesdropping, but you know, with 56 tries, you can decipher. So we take that bit, and based on that bit, we control in the D2A interface either the amplitude or the frequency of the transmission. So 
we add a little extra driver here which will change the power, that, the transmission power of the signal. So we're slightly increasing the amplitude when the stolen key bit is 1 or in a different version we slightly increase the frequency when the stolen key is uh, the stolen key bit is 1. When it's 0 we just leave it alone. So one bit at a time if that stolen bit has a logic value of 1 it will increase either the amplitude or the frequency of the transmitted signal. Very simple circuitry, very easy to hide. The area is uh, minimal, even in such a small proof of concept design. Here is what happens in a transmission through the type 1 trojan, the one that increases the amplitude. Uh, we consistently increase the amplitude by something in the order of 120 microwatt. So when the stolen key bit is 0, which is equivalent to non-existence of the hardware Trojan, you get the red line, and this is the transmission of a logic one. If the stolen key bit is a one, you just slightly increase by 120 microwatts. Now, this is a very small amount that is not going to throw your signal out of its specs. It's not going to be too large and consume too much power so that you will see something alerting there. It can be absorbed because process variations, fabrication process variations, can cause much more than that. The same thing happens with the frequency. Now, this is a type 2 trojan where we essentially increase the frequency by about 0.4 gigahertz. Remember, we're playing in the range of 4 to 6 gigahertz. Now, if it so happened that my chip was operating at 5.9 gigahertz and I added a, another 0.4 and now it's above the range, OK, this chip will appear to be a bad chip. But you won't know that there's a Trojan there. All you know is that the chip is not operating within its specs. Well, you'll throw it away. You won't sell that chip. This, this looks like jitter. Um, Correct. Correct. Now, uh, jitter <coughs> per, well, well it's not it, drift, right, right. It, but it doesn't look like noise because it is systematic. It looks like jitter, but it doesn't look like noise. So let's distinguish the two. Um, so, and the interesting thing is that we don't rely on a particular value. What we rely on is the delta. That there's going to be a delta between when I am transmitting a zero, when the key bit is a zero, and when the key bit is a one. Or there's going to be a delta here when the key bit is a zero and when the key bit is a one. So if I'm the perpetrator and I know what I have done, I'll just listen on the channel and here's what I will do. I will identify the two different levels of transmission very slight difference, but I can pick up a difference of 120 microwatts uh, in the power of transmission, especially if I do it over an entire block, which is 64 bits, or it could be 256, etc. So I will know when, a, in this particular block that was transmitted, whether a stolen key bit was a zero or whether it is one. Once I know what the two levels are, I'll just keep listening. Yes? But every time you transmit a bit, right? Even with the same chip, you don't always get the same right? Sometimes you might get, you know, 100 microwatts, sometimes you might get 110 microwatts. But this is one block, so it's not a transmission now and a transmission half an hour later. Those are the, the peaks of one block. They cannot be that much different because your environmental conditions do not change that fast. So the delta that we have as a margin is higher than what you will see as jitter, as noise because of that. You're continuously transmitting for every bit you're transmitting within a block. Within a block. Okay. I essentially send it 64 times. And you will see that you know, okay. the next block that you will send, will, if it's a 1, it will be in the same range. If, it's a, if the stolen bit is a 0, you will see a little drop there. So what do you do? You get the two levels. You listen for uh, 56 consecutive transmissions, 56 blocks. And you have a rotated version of the key, which you can then sift around. You know, 55 tries, 56 tries, you basically have the key. Uh, now, um, so yes? Wouldn't an attacker actually want to encrypt the key <coughs> so that you couldn't detect that's what the information actually is? Um, you mean attack, uh, encrypt the key? 
the attacker is trying to steal the key. They would want to obfuscate, but see, data. the problem is that as soon as they try to obfuscate, they will start burning more power and they will start doing things that will create more of a sign that something is going on there. I believe that the attacker will rely on the element of surprise, which is me as a defender, I don't know on what parameter they will have hidden this delta. I just showed you two very simple examples of slightly increasing amplitude of slightly increasing frequency. It could be any combination thereof. And could be advanced structures where then they could do statistical post-processing and extract it. Okay? But you don't want to do it on the chip because you will burn power and you will give out signs. You want to get what you know relying on the fact that the defender doesn't know what's on there and take it from there. So you want to do the minimal possible interaction on the chip or modification on the chip and then either a priori hide things because you choose the attacker has the element of surprise they pick when how and where to stage the attack the defender doesn't know this information um, this shows transmissions sample transmissions of 100 chips which we generated with Monte Carlo simulation. Our Monte Carlo simulation used 5% process variations on all parameters of the chip, including lengths, widths, oxide thicknesses of the transistors. Everything that goes into the SPICE model is uh, uh, through Monte Carlo sampled with a 5% variation. The blue line here is an envelope of the uh, mean plus, three standard, plus minus three standard deviations which we computed from another 100 chips sampled from this distribution. So these are Trojan-free chips. Okay? So this is what the transmissions will look out of these clean, trusted chips. This has Trojan 1, and this has Trojan 2. And these are 100 Trojan-infested chips, again, from, with that characteristic uh, distribution. And even visually, you will see that they're within the envelope and you can't tell, if I gave you one of these 300 plots and I told you which of the three distribution it comes from, you have no way of knowing. It's impossible because the modification, the impact of the change is so small that you cannot really tell uh, that something is, has been altered in the transmission. And you can, we've repeated this with multiple different transmission blocks and there's no way to tell by just looking at the transmission itself. Um, we looked at existing methods and whether they would be able to pick up these Trojans, and none of them worked. Um, as I said earlier, we've designed the Trojans so that they will evade all the functional, structural, and uh, parametric tests of the typical test procedure for a chip like that. We tried out methods um, that use global power consumption traces. The Overhead is in the 0.02% range and it will not be picked up because it is not below the noise level and below what the process variations would uh, incur. We looked at local current traces, seeing the current and measuring the car local currents. There is an interesting methodology that divides up the chip into a grid and then has um, essentially power monitoring taps where you can see what is happening in its part of the grid. But in order to do something that would be effective in our case, we calculated that we would need 20 power grids with at least 30 uniformly located power ports. So I would need an extra 30 uh, pins in order to be able to tell whether this chip is compromised or not, which is completely unrealistic. There's no way you can do that. Uh, we also tried our own older method, which has to do with path delay traces. We tried to see whether the added hardware on the digital part delays the critical path by an amount that we can trace. And we could not. It was, again, below what the process variations do uh, affect on this chip. So uh, the message here is that a cleverly de designed hardware Trojan can be hidden within the margins allowed by the fabrication process variation. So if I'm an attacker, that's what I will go. I, I'm not going to go and change what the chip does. I'll just hide extra stuff in the, in the margins that exist. Yes? What if you have a gate count on the chip? For every pass, you don't have a delay, but you have the number of gates that you have to go through. 
would that detect that? Uh, no, because I can always modify the logic so that I can, I can sustain the same number of gates. After all, in a long, in a long path, you might have repeaters, you might have, you know, if you put a, an AND gate followed by an AND gate, you can do the same logic with three gates. Right? And what has been chosen depends on the high level, on the, sim, on the logic synthesis system. So it's not an accurate count because the perpetrator might be able to evade that defense also. But I would assume that this logic synthesis has been done before the path, right? So, okay, so you're saying there's a path that has five gates. Okay. And there's a three input end in, in the middle. What I'm saying is that whenever I deliver something to the fab, I can have an enumeration of all the paths from input to output with the number of gates between the input and the output. Okay, and then I'll give you the chip. How will you look at the chip and count the gates on the chip? That's a good question. You'd have to have a, a microscope uh, <coughs> and do reverse engineering, and that's, again, not feasible. Yeah. So, yes? What would the added failure rate to be to you know, the, the modification? Uh, I'm sorry? The added failure rate for the chip tab. The added because of this modification, you're 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 saying that there will be an impact on the yield of the process. So right. fewer chips might work because yeah, you have. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, why would the yield drop? Because you've added a little bit of area. See, you're not increasing the actual area of the chip. You're just using some empty space. Not necessarily in, in yield, but in uh, failure of testing because you pass the specs that you're. I at. see. Yes, uh, you're right. You will you will probably see a few more te uh, chips on the tail ends of the distribution failing now. Um, so what would do a manufacturing line when they notice a little drop in the yield? Let's say you have an extra five percent yield drop. So uh, you'd probably try to trace the the reason, and there's a a few thousand steps along the way, you know, who provided the silicon, who provided the metal, what chamber was it baked. There's so many things in the fabrication process. The people that do yield analysis today, they use so, such primitive statistical analysis tools. I have a student right now at IBM who was playing with this and he came back saying, I, I want to do a PhD on this because these guys are just, they don't know what they're doing. And then a month later, of course, he said, well, it's so complicated. That's probably why they don't do anything <laughs> more. <laughs> it's already complicated. If you throw complicated tools at it, no one knows what's going on. Uh, you, will, you will probably see an impact on the yield. Uh, I don't think that you will be able to attribute it back to the existence of a Trojan and distinguish that from all other possible reasons. That I don't know how, how I would be able to do that. Yeah. So, um, this plot shows the population of 300 chips that I told you about, four, uh, 300 chips, 400 chips that I told you about. Um, the blue ones were used to calculate the envelope, the genuine chips, and the two Trojan 1, type 1, type 2 Trojans. The three axes here um, are three different transmissions. I picked randomly three um, blocks of bits, and I transmitted each of them and measured the power, okay? uh, the transmission power, not the power that the, the chip burned. This is the transmission power. You cannot distinguish the populations. And if you do it on multiple dimensions, again, there's no way to distinguish them. The populations fall upon each other because each of these chips passes the specs. So um, on each dimension, you're correct, and the populations fall upon each other. However, there is structure. The, the, the blue from the green and the red have a different structure because you are transmitting more. Okay? It's just that when you just look at the transmission power, you're not systematic enough to pick up that structure. But even if you do something as simple as a principal component analysis, just run, throw six blocks at it, six uh, transmissions, measure the power, then gather your data and do a very simple principal component analysis and then project on the three top principal components. Here's what it looks like. You have the clean population, the type 1 Trojan and the type 2 Trojan very nicely separated. So then what we did is we said, okay, let's find a very simple way, just a, a minimum volume encoding ellipsoid, surround these guys, and then every new chip, if it doesn't fall within the MVE, it's Trojan infested. 
If it falls within, it will trust it. You can use an SVM to, or any kind of classifier that you want in order to separate the populations. But the point is that if you do analyze statistically the measurements, the structure is there and you can pick it up. And I don't need to know what the structure is. I just run a blind PCA here. And then all of a sudden, they're nicely separated in space. So what we believe as is the most um, uh, hopeful at, uh, defense against these attacks is an ensemble of carefully crafted statistical analysis methods on carefully chosen parameters from the chip that will allow you to build this complicated fingerprint distinguishing Trojan infested from clean uh, chips. To summarize, since we're already out of time, um, we believe that this works because Trojans do impose structure. Without this structure, the attacker won't be able to steal the information. Uh, the statistical analysis identifies the structure without needing to know its form a priori. Uh, this is, to our knowledge, the first investigation of the problem of hardware Trojans in the wireless domain, in the analog RF domain. Uh, we think that we made realistic assumptions of what an attacker would do, and uh, we have a generic solution which doesn't really uh, depend on how the attacker will stage the attack, as long as it is within this general framework that we built. Uh, we are currently uh, trying to tape out our chips and demonstrate the methodology in silicon as opposed to uh, spice level simulation data. Uh, we're trying to extend it to have more complicated types of trojans with, with combine various parameters instead of just having a, a little delta, and a broader arsenal of uh, advanced statistical analysis methods for detecting them. Uh, we're also toying with the idea of um, an on-chip monitoring methodology. So we want to build on the chip a little monitor that does this analysis on the fly in real time, because sometimes the Trojan might not be activated until later when the chip is deployed in the field. So you want to be able to authorize it and uh, you know, give a stamp of approval. It's clean at fabrication time. But if the Trojan is activated later, you also want to be able to either periodically or continuously monitor its operation and again say, OK, it seems to be clean still. Nothing, nothing has been activated uh, to endanger this. Yes? So is your analysis something that you have to do on the chip in isolation? Or if, if I buy a commodity smartphone or whatever, can I just run the test on the output power of the antenna and do your analysis? Do I have to take the thing apart to do this? Is that why you want your own chip monitor? Or can I just take a commodity unit as a black box and test it? You could do that. So, uh, so you're saying you will use the processing power of your, of your uh, smartphone to assert whether that one particular chip on there is trusted or not, if it has exhibited any. Uh, yeah, maybe I buy a batch of 500 smartphone mm -hmm. units from my company, and I pick two randomly out of them and, and look for statistically relevant patterns in, in, you know, in their output. Correct. But the, the, the smart attacker will, have, will not compromise all of them. He will statistically, again, uh, he will sample on the wafer, the reticle that you built doesn't have to be identical. So you don't have to build all of the chips on the wafer with a Trojan. Some of them will have it, some of them will not. So if you buy a batch of 500 chips, it's not necessarily true that all of them will have it or none of them will have it. But if I tested all of them, it's conceivable I can use your method without actually pulling the chips out. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, we have developed a very similar methodology where we're fabricating on a, on a uh, transceiver. We have a tiny little neural network which monitors the operation of the transceiver and uh, tells you whether it is still within specs or not. It has nothing to do with Trojans. It has to do with the testing of the device and bringing a neural network that monitors <coughs> its operation. So we're trying to do the same, build this little neural network right there to tell you between the two classes, trusted and untrusted. Of course, you need to train the neural network and you need to store the program of the neural network, the weights, on chip using non-volatile memory, and it can get difficult. But the general idea is that let's not assert once, let's continuously, continuously assert trustworthiness uh, post-deployment in the field of operation. Yes? But since this is on chip, isn't it subject to, to the same attack? Correct. So a smart attacker that would figure out what this chip is doing 
that I'm the monitor that tells you whether I'm trustworthy or not would attack that and say, always say trust it. But with my approach of the neural network, since I program the neural network after I get the chips back, the attacker doesn't know what the neural network is actually doing. Yes, but you might think you're programming it, even though you're not, right? Two. Two. So it is, I mean, this is a chess game. Yeah. Okay? You're setting up your defenses, and uh, the attacker attacks, and you, know, you make your moves and see what happens. I don't think there's a perfect uh, uh, bulletproof solution. The same thing happens in the software world, and it's even easier there because modifications are simple. So yes? normally a bad guy would try to target his attack, right? Uh, now, you just said that the chip turned it away from it, not on it, compromised. So that would kind of reduce what, how they can actually target it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So shouldn't they be more interested in doing a whole batch? Yeah. Uh, it depends on what, what your objective is. Yeah. Um, if you're just trying to create havoc, oh, yeah. some chips failing will just oh, do yeah, it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you want to steal the information communicated between a fighter jet and its base, Yes, you need to have a tracking mechanism that will tell you that this particular chip ends up on that particular uh, jet, and that is almost impossible to do uh, yeah. in today's uh, uh, chain, supply chain. Uh, there's just not such uh, information systems in place. Even within the fabrication companies, um, very few companies keep a, 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 an informed database and actually use the data of where is the chip on the wafer, x, y coordinates, uh, what bots did it end up with, what product, what customer. There is, there is some accountability, but far less than what I would have thought a big semiconductor manufacturing uh, company would have in place. That's, I think that's kind of really scary about this is you, you don't, you don't, how do you, how do you patch that to this stuff? <laughs> Um, you yeah, you away. can't really patch it. You have to you throw it out. <laughs> you throw away. There is a reprogrammable hardware, reconfigurable hardware that you could use, but not to the extent where you can patch in yeah. software. You have to throw it away. You can't fix it anyway. Correct. You can't really fix it. It's expensive. Yes. Can you exploit the, uh, the delay from you set something to the manufacturer until it comes back? Usually it takes time to put something that sophisticated in to the end stage of a chip, right? Well, the other possibility would be you contact multiple manufacturers and, 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 and manufacture multiple batches and then come back and do this statistical analysis. True. I mean, what you're describing is known as N-way programming, right? So <laughs> uh, you could do that. You could send your devices to multiple uh, uh, fabrication facilities. It's not so easy because if I want to design a chip and use IBM's foundry, the rules for building the chip are completely different than if I want to use TSMC's foundry. So I'd have to have already two different devices to begin with so my comparison does not become valid. So there's a, there, there, there are practical issues that prevent this from happening. And that's why maintaining a completely trusted supply chain is not feasible today. Or the cost would be exuberant to do something like that. If there are only, like, say, a finite number of these facts, mm -hmm. right, you can either go through, you know, uh, legal process or other other process and make sure they respect what the customer sent them. How do you make sure? Them, right. This is how, say, the government controls privacy. You, you trust the Google, for example, won't leak your personal message. But there, if there are only a finite number of these big companies are, are, are holding accountable for private information, uh, maybe that's fine. Right? Versus you have to show that you know, whatever the email you use in Gmail is not... That is correct, but these companies have employees and they have contractors. So it is not that the US government doesn't trust IBM or doesn't trust TSMC, even though TSMC is not a US company. So. Uh, they trust the company, there's a legal agreement, there's repercussions for violating this agreement, but there's so many people involved in the, in the chain of events that anyone in, at any stage could potentially stage the attack without the company knowing. So IBM would have no idea that some employee that is involved in the production of the masks fiddled with the masks and added the hardware trojan. So there is no accountability 
for every single person involved in this production. And that's where the problem lies. It's not that the actual business transaction is not trusted. The business transaction is, is trusted. But the people underneath that create the product cannot be trusted, especially when they don't even fall under US jurisdiction. Because they're in Malaysia, they're in, you know, whatever. I'm just random names. So uh, that's, that's the real problem. So that's all I have. If you're interested in learning more, you can feel free to email me. And thank you for uh, attending my presentation.